rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates. Heaven, let it rain. Let it rain. Let your glory fill this place. Let your all-consuming fire fill this tabernacle and purify our hearts. Surround us in this place and breathe new life within us. Send a refreshing Lord and saturate our hearts. Let your glory fill this place. Let your all-consuming fire fill this tabernacle. Purify our hearts. Surround us in want you to breathe new life within us. Send a refreshing Lord and saturate our hearts. Rain on us. Breathe on us. Shower down. Shower down. Send your spirit Please join me for the call of worship. We have gathered in this space to worship God. We have come seeking comfort, inspiration, community, and grace. We have come to open ourselves to the power of God's presence in our midst. We have come to offer up the seasons and the turnings in our lives and to ask God's help in our learning and in our growth. We are eager to respond to God's direction. We are ready to sing as God gives us voice. Faith of God, you, are, you have placed us in the vineyard of the world to tend and to care for all of your creation here. You have called us to be faithful people. Send among us what we need to do as you intend. Grant that we may hear your voice and follow in the way of Jesus. Help us to, to strive to live as your people. We praise you for the abundance of opportunities you have blessed us. You have blessed us. Amen. Love divine, all loves excelling. Number 384.
Please join me in an attitude of prayer. By your spirit, O oh God, still our restless spirits and unstop our ears. Let us hear your word that it may be at work in us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Today's scripture comes from Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected, to yield, he expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do with my vineyard that I have not done with it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and shall be overgrown with bears and thorns. I will also command the, cloud, the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts and the house of Israel and the people of Judah are the Lord's pleasant planting. The Lord expected justice but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. I've sure been faithful, but God's got a purpose, and I know my God is able. I've got a seed in the ground that God is blessing, no more stressing. I've got a seed in the ground, and now I'm knowing. And it's showing this is my season for grace, for favor. This is my season to reap what I have sown. This is your season for grace, for favor. This is your season. Perfect, but I've sure been faithful. But God's got a purpose, and I know my God is able. Cause I got a seed in the ground that God is blessing. No more stressing. I've got a seed in the ground. Now I'm knowing. God is showing, this is my season for grace, for favor. This is my season to reap what I have sown. 
I don't know about you, but it is my season, amen? Can we stand for the gospel reading? It comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. And it says, when he entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will, tell, I will also tell you what, by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he said, he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I always wondered why the preacher was such a big deal when the music was that good. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I want to thank Dean Mosby for the invitation to come and preach today. I know this is chapel. It's not Sunday morning. It's not church. And by the way, I walk. You've seen me lecture, many of you, so you know this is not a surprise. But this is still the people of God. Amen. We still belong to each other. We still belong to the one who hung on the cross. And we're here together to be able to come and to seek a blessing from our Savior today. So thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here, for making time for this means of grace, where we can be a means of grace to one another as we seek the means of grace of heaven together. This passage from Isaiah. So when I got the message that I was going to be preaching on this passage from Isaiah, I mentioned it to Dr. Lester. Some of you know his office is right down the hall from mine and he and I wander into each other's offices frequently. And he asked me, so what passage did you get? And I said, oh, Isaiah 5. And he said, oh, you got a love song. And I said, have you read it? 
Like, I realize you haven't read past Malachi in the Bible, right? But other than that, have you read Isaiah 5? I said it ends with like a scorched earth policy. There's bloodshed and there's destruction. I said, this is not much of a love song going on here, right? But he said, no, the Hebrew Bible scholars, when they are researching different genres of literature, one of the things that they say is that there are two great examples of ancient Near East love songs. One of them is Song of Songs, and the other is Isaiah 5. And I thought, that's really interesting. And so that kind of stuck in my head, because no matter how many times I read it, what I kept coming back to is not love, but judgment, right? There's judgment in this, severe judgment. And I got to thinking, you know, I think I know what Dean Mosby was considering. She was looking at who was available to preach. She was looking at what the passages were coming up. And she's like, the evangelism guy, he's comfortable with hell. We'll have him preach the judgment passage, right? You know, so we'll do that. You're not wrong. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that's, that's what I think happened. Notwithstanding, that's what we've got. As one of our professors that used to be here used to say, we may not like all of it, but the scripture, the Bible, the whole thing, it's ours. And we've got to deal with it. So what do we do with that passage? What do we do with it? Well, I think the first thing that we can recognize here is, go through it a little bit, we, we have a, a landowner. A man that decides that he's going to establish a vineyard and he puts great time and effort and care into building the vineyard, putting it together so it'll be successful. And then having done that, he waits for the harvest. But when the harvest comes, he's disappointed because everything that he's put into it, it hasn't, it hasn't come up the way that he thought it would. And that's what brings the judgment. Jesus actually, if you think about it, he riffs on this passage later. He'll have a parable of the tenants that he gives, right? In the parable of the tenants, he does something similar, except it's not that it's bad fruit that grows. Rather, it's the workers themselves. The, there's good fruit, but the workers refuse to yield the share that belongs to the landowner. They won't give it to him. And even though there's person and after person, there's messenger after messenger that he sends, they ignore those messengers or they deride those messengers or they reject and worse, as we move on, they humiliate and then persecute and finally kill those messengers. So what do we do with this passage? Well, let me start by saying what we don't do with it. As somebody who does deal with hell, <laughs> One of the things that we don't do is use these passages to proclaim judgment against those who are the heathen, those who are outside of the church, those who are outside of the Christian faith, much less use this to argue for some form of anti-Semitism. We don't do that with these passages. There's nothing in these passages that looks outside of the vineyard. This is only about what's going on inside. It's only about the fruit that's being born within the vineyard. It's only about, if we use Jesus' parable, the workers who are already inside the vineyard. Insofar as there's a judgment, the judgment comes to those who have already said yes to working for the landowner. Now that should give us pause. Because in some ways, this is sort of a sequel message to something that we've been running through in chapel, Four weeks ago, we had convocation. And in convocation, what did we do? We, we celebrated those of you who had said yes to seminary for the first time. Those of you who are first-year students. We celebrated that because you had heard the voice of God calling you, saying, come and be prepared and equipped for the work that I have for you. And you came and you have given your time and your energy and your money to be here. And we celebrated that. And then two weeks ago, we commissioned those of you who are going out into field education. Those of you who are a little farther along in your seminary training and beginning to discern exactly what kinds of ministries you might be called to do. 
And we celebrated you for going into those, for giving yourself over to that. Because much like those folks who worked in the vineyard, you're foregoing the opportunity to work somewhere else. Somewhere else that might pay a little bit better. Somewhere else that might be a little more impressive on the cultural resume than saying, I'm a community organizer, or I'm someone who works for ecological justice, or I'm a pastor. You said yes to that. And it's good that we celebrated you for that because you know how many voices are out there calling for us to give our time and our money and our energy and our allegiance to them. How many other voices are out there trying to pull us away to say, be ours. And you said, no, I hear above that the voice of the one of heaven calling out and saying, come follow me and let me prepare you to go and serve in my vineyard. So we celebrate and we should because it's no small thing to be able to discern that, much less to give what you have given to be able to follow that. But as it turns out, and that's what this passage tells us today, as it turns out, the God who sends us, who calls us, also holds us to account. And does that surprise us, really? If the boss sends us to go do work, doesn't the boss want us to do a good job? The God who calls, the God who sends, also holds accountable. That's what these passages are telling us. That God expects us to bear good fruit and to bear fruit that we share back with God. We don't just keep it for ourselves. So, how do we do that? How do we do that? Those of you in my Wesley passage or class, by now you should recognize I'm going to pick up on one of his little moves. I'm going to ask two questions and answer them in series. First of all, what is the fruit that we're called to bear? And secondly, how do we share it? So first of all, what is this fruit? As you get called out into the ministry, as you get called out into the classrooms of the seminary, there are going to be all sorts of things that you can have that will measure whether you're successful or not. Did I get all the right marks on the rubric of the syllabus when I was turning in this assignment? Did I meet the requirements for being able to graduate because I've checked all the little boxes on the grid that I've got that shows what it takes to get an MDiv or an MA? when you go into the field education site, depending on what you do. Are you a community organizer? Did you organize together enough votes and enough money to be able to advocate on behalf of the marginalized? If you're a youth pastor, how many children did I have come in to my classes? How many Sunday school classes did I teach? How much curriculum did I have to develop? If I'm a, a regular pastor, did I grow my church? Did I bring in anybody new? Were there professions of faith made under my preaching? How many sermons did I preach? How many funeralizing sermons did I give? There are all kinds of metrics that we're going to be given to be measured by. And all of that is fruit of a sort. It demonstrates achievement. But is that the fruit that God is looking for? Is that the good fruit that God wants? I'm going to use a passage that's not in the lectionary for today, Dean, if that's all right. I think St. Paul has something to say to us about that. 1 Corinthians 12. Paul is talking to the Corinthians and they're all excited about all their different kinds of special blessings that they've received, all the different gifts that they've got, all the different roles they're going to play in the ministry. They're excited about it. They know that something's going to happen. And Paul says, yes, you're part of a body. You're going to go out. You're going to do amazing things. Some of you to prophesy, some of you to teach, some of you to serve, some of you to administrate, some of you to evangelize. And now I will show you a more excellent way. All those things are good. 
But there's better fruit yet. Because if I speak in the tongues of humans and angels, but I have not love, I am only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Can we go a little bit beyond? If I get all A's in all my classes, if I get top scores in all my rubrics, to the point that I master divinity itself, that I can be a doctor of ministry itself, that I can doctor philosophy itself, but I have not love, I have earned nothing. If I have built together the greatest mega church in the county, if I have attracted more people than any pastor in the history of my district, if I have impressed my DS, my presiding elder, my bishop, and I have not love, I have nothing. If I have been the most impressive politician and I have garnered the votes that I need and I have passed legislation to establish justice on behalf of the poor, if I have done all that needs to be done to help bring this world to healing and I have not love, I have nothing. You want me to bring it home here? If I've been promoted to full professor of evangelism, and I've written books that thousands of people have bought and read, and I've been invited to preach all around the world, and I have not love, God is not impressed. The good fruit that God is calling us to is not just our achievement. It's love. God calls us to love. We all know people who carry the title of pastor and demand on its authority, but they don't love. We all know people who can work the politics of Springfield and of Washington and who can get legislation passed, but they don't love. We all know people who have all kinds of amazing achievements, who are brilliant scholars, who can understand all things and who can explain it wonderfully in books, but they don't love. We know people who know to have children, but they don't love. God says, it's wonderful that you can do all these things. It's great that you can do all these things that, that look like achievements on your resume, and I'm glad you've got it. But the fruit that I want, the good fruit is this. Are you loving as you do it? Has your character changed so that you can love? Because all the rest of it, the degrees, the achievements, the accomplishments, None of it means anything in heaven if there's no love. Now you ask, so what do we do with that? How do we share that love? How do we yield the good fruit back to the landowner? I think the problem is, is that too often when we think about this, we try to think about it in heroic terms. I need, to do, I need to do something big. I need to do something big and loving. right? Something that's going to be amazing that everybody will see and get excited about. But that's not what love looks like, according to Paul. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Do you hear that? There's simplicity in what it looks like to love. How do we yield that good love, that simple love back to God? We give it to the messengers God sends to us. And who are those messengers? They're the everyday people that we're dealing with. They're the folks that are sitting next to you right now. They're the folks that you saw when you were walking up the staircase to get here. They're the people that you passed when you were walking in from the the parking lot. They're the person that you saw, the barista that was making your coffee earlier today. They're the, they're the folks that were working at the cashier at the Jewel or at the, the Walgreens or wherever it was that you went. It's those people. God is sending you those people. They're the messengers of God. And God is saying, will you yield a little bit of love to them by being patient with them, by being kind to them, by being willing to forgive when they make little mistakes? Can you just treat the people around you in simple acts of love? No one else is going to see it. It won't go on your resume. It won't be impressive. But you'll have loved on that person. And that's what love looks like in practice. Now it gets harder than that. It's not just about the barista mispronouncing my name when I go to Starbucks. Right. It's about dealing with the consular when I'm trying to get my F-1 visa at the U.S. Embassy in my home country. It's about dealing with the guy who's working as the clerk at the DMV when I've been sitting there for three hours already and they tell me I'm missing one piece of paper yet to be able to get done what I want to get done. It may be dealing with unresponsive seminary offices or professors or students that are in your group that you've got a joint grade with. Can we be patient? Can we be kind? Can we be gentle? That's what love looks like. And that's what God is looking for. Because every one of them, every one of these people that's coming into our lives, all of them, they're the messengers God is sending. And God is saying, will you offer them a little of the love? the good fruit. And it may be something that's involved with your calling. Maybe these are people that are part of who you're trying to to advocate for. Maybe these people are part of your congregation, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're just folks that are along in your everyday. It doesn't matter. They're the messengers God has sent. If it's that simple and yet that profoundly hard, how do we get there? How do we get from where we are right now? You remember the beginning of the passage in Isaiah? It says, first the landowner went out and did everything to make it possible for the fruit to be good. The landowner went out and got the ground all prepared. Built up a hedge around it to to provide protection, build a watchtower to make sure nothing could come at it that the landowner didn't know about. He did everything that he could to make sure it was well watered and cared for. God doesn't just say, you need to offer love to others. God has well watered each of us as well already. How? Because God has also sent people into our lives that has poured love into us. How many of you sitting here today have a family that has disrupted its life so that they could be here to support you while you get your degree? How many of you have tribes or congregations or families that are back home that are providing the money to help support you in being here? How many of you have folks who along the way whispered in your ear, I see something in you. You have a gift. I see something great in you. I know God wants something for you. And you are here because you heard the encouragement. You had the love of God poured through them to you today. God doesn't just say, okay, love. God says, 
Love because I first loved you. It's because I first loved you that you now have the ability to grow and develop. Because others have poured that love into you, now you can pour it back out. See, the problem is this. Even though we're in the vineyard and there's this hedge around us and there's a watchtower, those voices that we heard God's voice above, they're still calling to us. They're still telling us, you may have made a dumb decision to go work in the church, but you know what? You can still do things our way. If somebody's mean to you, you bite back. If somebody's hurting you, you hurt back. God says, love your neighbor as yourself. Because I've loved you, you also love. It turns out Dr. Lester was right. This is a love song. It just so happens that the lover and the judge is the same God. But the judgment is not about have you lived up to all these achievements. It's not about did you tick all the boxes. It's not about do you look this impressive. The judgment is, have you simply received the fullness of love that I already have waiting for you here in this place? And having received it, now will you pour it out to your neighbor? Because each neighbor that comes, each one that shows up, that's my messenger to you. And I'm asking for the fruit back that I've grown in you. The good fruit of love. I know it's not the way we do things very often. But I want to take a moment here as I close out the sermon to invite you, if you need a moment, to linger before God. To just come on up. As they say in the black church, I want to open the doors of the church for a moment here. Invite you to come forward. If you just need to linger for a moment and remember that you are loved. To remember that the Holy Spirit came and set the ground for you. To remember that you've been well watered. You've been provided for. You've had people that God has sent to give you encouragement and support to fill you with love before you got here. Come forward for just a moment and just pause here by the altar and take a moment to come and seek. Seek that love for yourself. And then pray for those that God has sent along into your life. Pray for those that need to feel that love as well. Who is it? Maybe it's someone who lives in the same apartment or the same house with you. Could be a spouse, could be a child, could be your neighbor next door, could be somebody that you saw earlier today in class that you got really upset with. Who is it that God's laid on your heart to make sure that you can offer some love to them as well? Let's just take a moment and receive the love of God and pray it out over whoever needs to receive it in our lives today. Almighty God, we know that you love us. And sometimes feeling that love just gets drowned out in the midst of the craziness of the world. 
and the armor that we put up, the ways that we want to protect ourselves. But as we try to clench our fists to keep ourselves protected, we close our hands from being able to receive the love that you're pouring out to us, both directly from you and from our brothers and sisters and those around us. Oh God, we ask, in this moment, remind us of how you love us. Prepare us to come before your table and to receive that love again so that we might go and bear the good fruit that you have grown in us in our love of others. We pray this in your matchless and loving name. Amen. Please join with me in prayers of the people. Um, I'll give a brief prayer. There'll be a, a period of extended reflective silence. And then I'll make a, a declaration, O God of hope, and please respond with, awaken us to your new world. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, O oh God of hope, awaken us to your new world. We pray for all leaders and people of the world that we may expose the powers and principalities of injustice and work together to build your reign of peace. O oh God of hope, fill your church with your love that we may be still and know that you're God and stand in, in wonder of your majesty. O oh God of hope, let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, O oh God of hope, awaken us to your new world. O oh God of hope, Rouse us to live in the present age and hope for your return. Inspire us to encourage each other to rend the earth and to press harder that we may think we can work toward your new creation. O oh God of hope, Give us courage to acknowledge human frailty, limitation, and even death with confidence in you. For you, you are Christ our Lord invites all to his table who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Loving God, you have planted us like a vineyard on a fertile hill. You cleared away the stones, planted us with choice vines, and kept watch over us by night and day but we have not yielded the good fruit that you expected or desired. We are overgrown with sin, choked with violence and injustice. Forgive us, we pray. Uproot our evil, prune away our sin, and shower upon us the gift of your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
May the all-merciful God forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be. That we may delight in God's will and walk in God's ways through Jesus Christ our Lord. Glory to God. Amen. We now invite you to stand and to offer signs of peace to one another. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. you please stand with me for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captive, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new spirit, a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, Take, drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink this as oft as ye shall in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and all glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. the confidence of those who God has called children. Let us offer to God the prayer that Jesus taught us in our own languages. The table of love is set, and all are welcome to come and share in the love of God. We'll take communion by intinction, we'll tear off a little piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and receive both kinds together. May you come.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I don't think this last hymn needs a lot of introduction. I know it's a little simplistic. Um, you probably didn't sing it last <clears throat> since you were in Sunday school or at a camp somewhere, something like that. But two things. One is that simple translates well. And we've got an international school, not an American school that just has some international folks in it. We have an international school. And so I think this hymn is one that everybody knows. And the second, sometimes we just need to be reminded, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. That's why you just got invited to his dinner party. Would you stand and sing with me? Jesus loves me. in two ways, if you would let me. First, I want to offer a blessing for you, and then I want to ask if we would all just turn and offer a blessing out into the larger world, that we would receive first the grace of God, the love of God, and then we would offer that back out as those who are workers in God's vineyard. And so may the God who cleared the ground in our hearts, who put up a hedge around us 
to protect us from evil, who built the watchtower to watch over us, who is the good shepherd that walks along beside us so that his rod and his staff will protect us, who's there with us even when we walk through the valley of death. May that God let love shine in our hearts so that we feel it today and let that voice of love speak louder than all the other voices calling us to allegiance. And now may that God who has so given us that love grant that we may be those who reach out in love to others. O oh God, we pray, pray your blessing over Evanston. We pray your blessing over Chicago. And not just the northern suburbs, <laughs> not just the Gold Coast, but Englewood and Little Village and South Chicago. We pray your blessing over Gary, Lord. We pray your blessing and your covering over Illinois and over all this land and over all of our homelands. We pray your blessing over our families. We pray your blessing over our home congregations and all those who have stood to say, yes, you are beloved and we see good things and good fruit in you. Thank you, Lord, for each one of them. And Lord, hear our call that they too may know the fullness of your love until the day that we grow up together and you look at us and say, your good fruit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.